So welcome back uh, to Making Sense of Crypto and Web3 uh, Exploration Podcast at Life Itself. We've had a little bit of pause and I'm delighted to be joined again by our close collaborator on this, Stephen uh, DL. Uh, and we're going to continue the exploration we've done before. You know, just for those kind of new, Web3 has become a mass phenomenon and it, very bold claims are made about its potential impact. Claims that go far beyond classic technology boosterism of better and faster to claim for the radical transformation and improvement of our economic and social systems. Now, at the same time, there's an extraordinary lack of agreement about these claims, even on basic points and definitions. This is one of the most controversial and polarizing topics with strong pro and anti camps that we have seen, especially in tech. And significantly, disagreement often cuts across classical ideological lines. There are blockchain, uh, you know, uh, zealots and skeptics in the libertarians and in the Marxists. That's a very unusual situation. And this series is about making, helping make sense of what is going on and to evaluate those key claims. And we're having this episode, especially today, it's been recorded on Monday, the 14th of November, because of some pretty dramatic recent developments in the space. Uh, we kind of paused some of our explanation a few months ago after we felt we'd covered quite a lot of the key ground, but in a way we've some of the reasons that so perfectly illustrate the things that we were talking about that we feel the need to discuss it. And we also think that this might be a good moment. People are kind of dead in this kind of flurry of new use around FTX, around, uh, well, the bankruptcy of FTX and other developments recently, uh, even the Celsius, which happened a few months ago, but which kind of post-dated our, our initial recordings. We thought it'd be good to bring this up to date and get, get, uh, get up with the news. So, Stephen, why don't I want to start with you uh, uh, on your thoughts here? It's like, so first of all, like, just what's happened? What's been going on um, that's relevant? Just to summarize it in a nutshell for people listening or listening in the future. Yeah. So, like, since our podcast holiday, there's been a few um, things that have happened in the crypto industry, to put it nicely. Um, there's been a lot of uh, meltdowns that have happened around these projects, and there's been a lot of contagion. Um Suddenly, it happens when you have one entity that suddenly ceases to exist and then has a lot of close links to other uh, partners in its ecosystem. Then there happens to be a lot of sort of cascading failures. And right now, what we're seeing in the last six months has been unprecedented. This is like a mini version of the global financial crisis happening in like a bottle. Like it's a very self contained sort of economic meltdown of a lot of different projects, um, the most recent of which is the most catastrophic which is the collapse of this uh, FTX uh, crypto exchange, which was widely heralded as one of the safe places in crypto to hold your money. Um, and it turned out really it wasn't that safe. And I would strongly encourage people to go back and listen to the podcast that Rufus and me did uh, very early towards the beginning of our efforts, uh, the one on unfettered capitalism and unregulated markets, because I went back and listened to that yesterday. And uh, a lot of the points that we spoke about the market structure, um, and the conflicts of interest around crypto exchanges seem remarkably prescient. And what we described there is pretty much exactly the problems that FTX had. And unfortunately, it played out pretty much like we predicted. Yeah. And so to describe, just just if I get it right, please you know, correct me, uh, Stephen. I mean, with, so, so for people who are not familiar or in, in maybe outside of crypto, FTX, there are exchanges in the crypto world, like there are stock or stock or currency exchanges in the normal financial system where you can exchange the tokens, buy or sell Bitcoin, buy or sell Ethereum or any of these other tokens or, or um, crypto assets. And um, FTX was perhaps, as you said, one of the most prestigious, it, just to give you a sense, it, you know, taken out, I think it, it, it sponsored ads at the Super Bowl. It was, it had a sponsorship relationship with Tom Brady, the, the, one of the most famous sports people, you know, certainly in the U S the most famous quarterback of all time. Um, and with his wife, I believe. And you know, there was, there was stuff in many, many magazines. And this was really like, you know, all over the place. And in addition, you know, the most kind of blue chip VCs. Uh, had got, you know, had got involved, invested significant $150 million or $20 million from Sequoia Capital at uh, FTX over the last, I think, year and a bit. So, and and FTX was very much, you know, like we're, compared to many crypto exchanges we, we could come to, which are a bit more, we're offshore, where it's a bit like, this is some kind of, 
maybe dodginess or something about it. These guys were like, we've got a US entity, we've got an offshore one, but it's because, you know, we want to be allow people outside the US and, you know, it's, we're really like doing it right. So that's what's particularly you're emphasizing there, Stephen, which is that FDX was sort of, it was the one early this year bailing out other people, being like, we're going to buy you in this distressed time. It's like, we're the JP Morgan of the, the financial crisis 10 years ago, where JP Morgan bought up other people who'd gone wrong and like JB Morgan were cautious. They got it right. They were, they were hovering up the good bargains, buying up Bear Stearns. And so it's a really big shock, uh, like a, like a cataclysmic event really for the crypto ecosystem, this bankruptcy, which was filed on, on Sun on Friday and which unfolded over a week of, of statements where it was kind of, there's no problem. Then there was a problem. Then they were going to merge with someone else. Then they weren't going to merge. And then, you know, well, maybe FTX.com was in problems, but the US entity was fine because they did things right. And then everyone sort of is bankrupt. All of the entities associated. So what, what is it, you know, you're saying in, in that podcast, if I recall, one of the things is like, it's just, we talked about why we have financial regulation and why in the crypto industry, most of that financial regulation is, is either uh, not being applied because crypto stuff is taking place in jurisdictions that don't apply it or is being ignored. And we're just seeing the kind of catastrophe, we, we predict we'd see the kind of catastrophes that happened in the 19th century and even the early 20th century. And that, that seems to be happening where particularly we want to emphasize the real tragedy uh, here is that many ordinary people, many, I only say, you know, people, uh, you know, the, the, the small investors, people with a few thousand or, you know, tens of thousands maybe, but of, of money have put them into these things and basically have lost their savings. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I can't overstate how drastic this is. Like if we were to kind of draw a comparison between the crypto ecosystem and the normal financial world, like this is the like a JP Morgan or like a Citibank collapsing. This is one of the biggest players that was handling, I think, 790 billion volume, like notional crypto value, obviously. But like, this is a lot of money. Um, they had the largest investors on the planet. This is like, you know, a Tiger Global, Sequoia Capital, um, SoftBank. Uh, these are nobody's fools. Actually, maybe SoftBank is a bit foolish. But, um, you know, these are some very you know, big institutions that were lining up to support this thing. And on the back of this, like a lot of these hedge funds were using FTX um, as their, their exchange. Um, and if we go back to what we said in that previous episode, like the problem is, is that um, FTX was set up in the Bahamas. Uh, it was an offshore entity set up in a tax shelter. Specifically, they chose the Bahamas because of basically the lack of regulation, because what they were selling was effectively securities products. Um, and it's almost kind of a misnomer to call FTX an exchange um, because we have no idea what goes on inside FTX. Um, basically, they take money from their customers and then you become a effectively unsecured creditor of a Bahamanian company of which you as a customer have no standing and the company has no legal obligation to deliver anything to you because you're doing this all cross-border. Um, and what goes on inside FTX is a black box because the company had effectively um, no independent board of directors. Um, they had no oversight. There were no regulators. Um, and it was basically staffed by a bunch of 20 somethings. Um, so like the matching engine, which is basically the, the core piece of software inside of an exchange, which basically matches, you know, bids and asks and basically tries to find uh, the price that you can match people's bids and their asks with, right? Um, we have no idea. This was a bespoke piece of software that the folks at FTX had written to basically, you know, match their buyers and sellers on this sort of alleged marketplace. Um, but it turns out, um, according to the Financial Times yesterday, um, they had apparently $900 million in assets compared to $9 billion on their books. Um, and so this is an insane amount of leverage that's basically in this entire marketplace. Um, their liabilities vastly exceeded their assets. Um, and it turns out, what they had was this hedge fund on the side called Alameda Research. Um, and they would take customer money from the exchange and commingle it with the hedge fund. And the hedge fund's sole purpose uh, is to enrich basically its limited partners, which is basically the people who are running the exchange. 
Um, and so this lack of segregation of funds between the exchange and the hedge fund and the inherent conflict of interest in that relationship um, is what gave rise to this entire collapse because the FTX directors were basically embezzling money out of the exchange from their customers and giving it to the hedge fund to place extremely leveraged spec um, speculative bets on extremely risky assets. And when the market trends downward, they got hit with a bunch of um, well, short positions that they couldn't fulfill. And the whole thing just came crashing down in about 48 hours. This is insane. Like imagine like, like Bear Stearns collapsing in 48 hours because of a tweet. Uh, this is unprecedented. Like what's going on? And this, this last week was completely mental. I've never seen anything like this in markets. Yeah. And, and I think what's so, let, I just really want to emphasize this. I think again, to my, maybe myself and audiences, often in crypto, there's a lot of like com complexity added. There's a lot of like jargon and stuff. But when you actually peel it back, the basic mechanics are quite simple and, and, and very old. You know, they're not, they're not actually especially novel. Like most of, most of, what's getting done has got done before and is, and what doesn't go well has not gone well before you know this is just to reiterate so just to pull out of what you just said Stephen, the things that go wrong um obviously in in banking and so on and, and you just said something which is maybe a bit subtle but normally when i give my money to a bank we imagine the bank kind of metaphorically imagine the bank kind of sits puts it i think in our mind like it's in a vault and i could just go in and get it out they're kind of almost just custod custodying it for me like Actually, that's not what happens in a bank either, or in most things. You become a you become a, a creditor of the bank. The, the bank owes you money back, but it's going to go and do things with your money. I mean, most classic we know they the bank, monk, bank takes your money and it lends it potentially to people who want to build a house or you know want to take out a mortgage. This is how um, they aren't just simply like safe deposit boxes. Um, and so you mentioned that when we put go to trade on something like FDX, um, people were basically in a way giving their money and then becoming you know, you're a creditor, you were owed money, but you were doing a cross border with almost no legal protection and so on. And to kind of go back, that's a reason because that can obviously go wrong, like a bank just make off with all your money, or like a really obvious thing a bank could do is take your money, um, lend that money to some other related party, which does something with it, and then not give it back. I mean, I'll just mention as aside, one of my favorite scandals of all time, which is the credit mobilier scandal of, um, uh, of the 19th century, which is about the, you know, Stanford, Leyland Stanford, where he wasn't so directly involved, but Durant, but which was around building the transcontinental railroad, which involved exactly this of taking money out of a bank and doing various things like this. And there's lots of protections we have to make sure a, a bank does not misuse customer funds for this precise reason. And secondly, uh, to make sure that there are related party transactions of this kind, that we don't have like a hedge fund and a bank really closely intertwined. There's a lot of rules about that, that we've created over uh the last century or the last decades to prevent these kind of things but in the crypto world it's like oh no those those are those are and, and to be clear this isn't just an oversight there is an active often assertion that these things are almost either unnecessary or even an obstacle to financial innovation it, would that be fair to fair to say um so I want to I want us to so just to say in that like don't get bamboozled by the the crypto jargon it's kind of simple it's like if you thought of it as like a bank or even like a stock exchange where you're going to, or to a stockbroker better, you've gone there, you've asked them to buy stocks for you. You expect them to look after your stocks for you. There's a bunch of rules were created to, to prevent misappropriation. But in this case, there were none of those rules uh, basically. And you could just giving your money, anything could happen. And in this case, anything did. Um, and, I, and I, and I think that's something we want to emphasize in this episode, which is there's going to be a lot of critique about Sam Bankman fried uh, the now ex CEO of um, of uh, FTX. There's going to be a lot of kind of personal statements about they're unreliable. How can they be so dishonest? Or they did all that. But there's something kind of systematic here. It, you know, there's something systemically problematic about the current setup. We would suggest, and that that's what we were talking about in this episode six seven months ago. And that's what you're seeing play out right now. And I think at this moment it might be worth rewinding because almost I think we were grasped our record our last really proper episode in April, May, early May. And that's just kind of the timeline from that point has been pretty amazing because starting in May, I think we had the Terra Luna collapse. Then we had Celsius and Voyager. Then we had Three Arrows Capital. Uh, we also had like BlockFi and others. And now we have FDX. Do you want to walk us through a little bit of that history 
in brief since since May for those who missed out to summarize again in maybe layman's terms or more simple accessible terms what's happened and what why sure it's been quite an interesting six months um this really all started with the collapse of a project called Terra Luna um which was a algorithmic stable coin so we actually did a big uh deep dive on this on the life itself website you can go to our wiki where we actually dived into this um to put it succinctly it was kind of a uh financial perpetual motion machine by which people thought that they could issue this completely synthetic asset which would always maintain its peg to a dollar without actually holding any assets um and the mechanism it did it alleged to do that was not sound um and there's some strong economic reasons why you could actually never build such a thing in practice um but they tried and it blew up um and it turns out um, a lot of the industry was using this um luna stablecoin as basically a dollar proxy um and what happens when you have you know billions of dollars sloshing around in something that people think is worth a dollar and then suddenly becomes not worth a dollar right suddenly there's this giant gaping hole <laughs> in people's balance sheets um and when terra collapsed um, a lot of people lost a lot of money um, it was retail investors, but um, most importantly, it was a bunch of very large crypto institutions uh, which were exposed to this stuff, and suddenly their balance sheet just like evaporated. Um, and that contagion, um, because a lot of contracts were denominated in this stablecoin, spread across the entire industry. Um, and so what we saw was a bunch of these lending platforms, called Celsius and Voyager, um, which acted as these sort of quasi banking institutions where they would take deposit or allegedly deposits um, from customers and they would offer um, yields on them. They would seemingly out of nowhere. Um, you would just give them, you know, $100 and they claim to give you, you know, 10, 20% um, seemingly out of thin air. Um, in practice, what was actually happening is that uh, on the back of this sort of quasi bank institution was a hedge fund that was taking. You know customer deposits and then trading them on highly speculative investments that they were basically you know sourcing from the rest of the ecosystem and when those investments became um affected by the terra contagion um they ended up having not able to fulfill their um withdrawal requirements and then a lot of customers decided to like um take out money from the lending platforms because they saw the broader ecosystem trending downward and that caused pretty classic bank run. Um, and that was particularly catastrophic because there was a lot of retail investors that were seduced into um, investing in Celsius and Voyager. Um, so they filed for chapter 11 a few months ago and the letters that you get to the courts are absolutely heartbreaking. It's really just like moms and dads and just like normal everyday people who were like putting their entire life savings in this institution. And it turns out the legal structure behind it, um, they have no guarantees of anything. There's no deposit insurance. Um, they basically become an unsecured creditor of Celsius, um, at which point then they're going to line up at the bankruptcy court in Delaware and wait, you know, three or four years to maybe get like, you know, 10, 15 cents on their dollar, maybe. Uh, that's really bad. Um, and a lot of retail investors got hurt. So then there's a bunch of other institutional players like three arrows capital um they had a particularly harebrained scheme where they were doing this particularly uh, it's like clever arbitrage play on top of uh a bunch of stable coins and i won't go into the details of that but they were overexposed to that their entire fund collapsed um what what was the detail of that what were they doing um so i'll point you at the uh crypto policy symposium which is a conference that i ran last month um where yeah. we did an entire video where um, we had a bunch of uh financial professors outline this in detail uh, look at the crypto contagion video and yeah. they outlined the specific play it's more detail than i have time to go into but um needless to say the balance sheet basically 90 percent evaporated the founders basically were living in singapore they hop on a plane head to dubai and they basically absconded with a bunch of money and then everybody that was invested in them, you know, which was a lot of the ecosystem, something now has a giant hole in their balance sheet. And you see how this kind of cascades and cascades where you have this kind of implosion somewhere in the ecosystem, then suddenly it just spreads elsewhere. And that eventually leads up to the last week um, in which um, FTX, um, you know, as a result of the broader market conditions, um, had this token that they were issuing called FTT, which is basically their internal infinite money machine basically by which they were printing this, this speculative asset. Um, and then one of their competitors ended up doing a, um, 
uh, taking a position in this thing and threatening to dump a massive portion of it, which would impact a lot of their holdings. Um, and because of the relationship between FTX and Alameda Research, which is the hedge fund, um, they were overexposed and suddenly they had withdrawal problems, um, which led to a liquidity problem. And then now they're probably effectively insolvent. Um, so what's going to happen is that same thing with Celsius. People are going to line up at the bankruptcy court. Um, but because this thing is set up in the Bahamas, you know, this is going to be a very long and complicated case to unwind. And probably most people are not going to see their money again. And, you know, I can't overstate this. They were doing, you know, $700 billion in notional flow every year. That's a lot of money. Um, and this was allegedly the blue chip, but like basically the safe haven for among yeah. crypto exchanges. They were literally trying to lobby Congress to create a regulatory regime for them to exist in the United States. Um, and it turns out like at the end of the day, the founders were just embezzling money. Um, and, you know, what's to say about this? It's, it looks systemic. <laughs> And then because of all these, you know, the problems arise out of the conflicts of interest and the lack of oversight. Um, and this kind of stuff has happened before in traditional markets in the past. Um, despite all this sudden and fury, like what Rufus said, a lot of this stuff looks like very classic bank runs. Like there's a lot of nuance and details about the assets, but nothing here is new. I mean, you know, outflows exceeded inflows. What happens at that point? Well, it becomes insolvent. You know, it's very simple. Yeah, exactly. And so let's let's walk that. I think a couple of these points through. So to just to recap, you know, starting from the Terra Luna collapse in May, I mean, things had already been going down. Bitcoin had already been trending. That there'd been the beginning of a kind of decline from let's say January, February with with global tightening. I mean, it turns out Bitcoin and other things looked like very risky assets that in a risk off environment like we're seeing with rising inflation have not been good. The point, let, let's just kind of, so there's Terra Luna, there's Celsius and Voyager, then there's kind of onwards to three arrows and then FTX. I just want to kind of recap there. There are really two and basic dynamics at play that we can walk through for ourselves, maybe our listeners, in what's going on when you unpack it or when you take away all, all, all the jargon of what's going on uh, in a lot of these cases. So one um model which we kind of we don't want to go into detail about with the case recordings but essentially a very big i would say um dynamic which showed up in terra luna which actually showed up with ftx this ftt coin and various others and actually ironically sam bankman fried i wrote this up in some detail in a twitter thread and a post on the, the sense making site actually walked through with matt levine of bloomberg and others like months ago like really how these work it's kind of it's it's kind of like a I, can, um, I also think like, um, sorry, Dirty Bubble Media has a very good thing about the flywheel. But essentially, let's explain this to the audience. There's two dynamics going on. One is um, th this, which we'll come back to, which is the kind of um, some kind of token that I've, I've issued. And the other is a bank run. So just saying a bank run, what happens if people is like banks are holding money and they have a they have a they have a term mismatch on me, which is that people have deposited money on a call. Like in theory, I can go to a bank at any time and get my money out. At the same time, for a bank to work, because there's not enough money and just you know, just holding your gold bars or your dollars just sitting in my bank doesn't really work for me to be a bank. I need to do something with your money. I need to lend it out so I can pay you interest and things like that. Normally, I lend out long term. I lend you a mortgage to build your house for some decades or I put it, invest it in so do something else, possibly relatively safe with your money, but I do something else. So classic, there's a, a bank run problem is a, what's called a liquidity problem. It's not necessarily that you're, um, you're actually like in a sense, actually bankrupt, your liability to exceed your assets, but you have a temporary mismatch. So in a classic bank run, I Stephen's holding my money, the St bank of Stephen, and he's holding money for me and other people. And he's lent the money out, assuming that any given time, only one of us will want our money back. You know, it says 10, in, 10 people have deposited money and we all come and want our money back at one time. And he's like, I don't have your money. Um, and then we're like, oh, my God, but you, you should give it back to us. And he's like, well, I, you know, I lend it out to people to do build their houses. And this has been addressed. This has happened catastrophically at certain times in human history uh, over a period of capitalism, certainly in the last 200 years. And it's largely got addressed with banking, with, with, insu with, with insuring deposits. So as long as a bank was healthy, the idea was there would be a government or something who would say, listen, we insure you the public's deposits. 
Um, and if, if someone needs to get their money back, we guarantee you'll get your money back, even if the bank doesn't have it right now because they've invested in a mortgage. And this also solves what normally is the classic part of a bank run, which is it starts out with a few of us wanting to get our money back. And then when we can't get our money back, everyone else panics. You know, Stephen doesn't have our money and then everyone wants their money back and the situation gets worse and worse. Now, I just want to emphasize this bank run point is generally, to be, to be fair, normally there is a sense that the underlying entity is solvent in the sense it does, if it could get its money back over the long term, it would have the money it needed to pay you. Um, it just doesn't have it right now. And therefore it makes sense for the government or someone else to kind of help it with the money in the near term. The other issue is that an entity is actually insolvent and we need to distinguish those because there could be a story of like FTX was just the victim or some of these others are just the victim of a bank run. When, as we'll come to, there's something very distinct going on. So there's two parts to this that I think, and Stephen, please correct me if I, again, one is we've just discussed, we will reiterate it. The bank can take your money and rather than putting it in nice, solid mortgages to solid people who are going to build their house and then pay off their mortgage over the next 30 years, I can go, I can go to Las Vegas and put it all on black, you know, like that. I, you know, I could in theory do that if there's no regulation. I can just take all my customers' money. I'm going to go to Las Vegas. I'm going to bet it all. And if, if it works out, what's great is I've doubled my money. I get to keep all the profits and I just give my customers their money back when they, do, they ask for it back. I'm rich. And worst case, I've lost all their money and then I go and live in Dubai or somewhere else without an extradition treaty to wherever your country is, right? It's a, it's a very, uh, th th and that's a classic, like straightforward fraud risk that we, f that we always face when we deposit money with people and, you know, in these cases. And there's lots of regulation around banks or other things that in theory stop people doing that, that make it difficult for them to do that, that make, you know, there's auditors, there's all kinds of protection. And, and to some extent, um, that seems to have happened in some of these cases. Um, we don't know. Well, things that look a little bit like that have happened. The thing that looks a bit like that, you know, is I'm going to go and take your money and bet it on some really risky investment. If it works out, I pay you back. And if it doesn't, I say, whoops, um, sorry about that. I just, you know, the crypto markets were against us. But it's very like going to Las Vegas and betting on black. And if I come up head, you know, if I come up winner, I'm filthy rich and I give my customers their money back. And if it doesn't, my customers are screwed, but I'm okay. The second thing I want to emphasize that, that really makes this whole situation, kind of helps the situation get going, is what you could call the, these like these these um, tokens. I mean, I don't know what, we, what, what are the ones they normally called on this? I mean, Terra Luna was a stable coin, but FTT, all of these coins, you basically invent your equity out of Minaire. You suddenly say, hey, you know, Stephen comes to me, Rufus, and says, hey, Rufus, um, I'm going to, you know, I've got this incredible uh, venture. Uh, um, I want you to buy these coins off me for a dollar. I've got a billion of them. And I'm like, well, what are you going to, what kind of business are you going to do? You say, don't worry about that. They're going to be worth a dollar. I promise they're worth a dollar to you. And I start buying them. If I, If you can convince enough people to buy them, you can basically issue kind of equity and or, or you call it equity or just some lottery ticket almost out of thin air and then you have this you have this money and that went on a lot and as you said it sounds completely implausible you can read even matt levine of bloomberg saying just sounds like i got a spreadsheet together put a million dollars in a, a million you know units in a column persuaded people they were worth a dollar and now i've got a million dollars how can that possibly work you might ask but it did and very crudely with a bit more fanciness we could go into that um, and that's how almost Tam Bankman Freed described it on his podcast. If you, you could do that. Now, there are ways that that might, you know, we can go into the detail, but roughly, I think, Stephen, that would be a, a fair way to describe this. Now, what's crucial to this story is if you can do that, you can generate capital in your bank or project, whatever you want it to look like, whether it's a saving, something like looks like saving, whatever, but you've got equity which is often crucial to start like this because you can then raise money from other investors or you can even say to people who are, you know, who are a bit suspicious, you come along and say, listen, I'm going to put my money in Stephen's, um, you know, crypto saving product that's promised me extraordinary 15% returns a year with no risk. How's that possible? You know, I might be a little suspicious, but Stephen could say, but no, no, no. I've raised $500 million in this, you know, in my own token and from investors I've got this equity cushion that protects you, 
But what, what we also aim in this is that the, the last thing that you can do when you issue your own, and which is totally normally illegal in traditional equity and other, I can issue equity in my company and then buy it myself to prop up the price. So I can go around saying, I've issued a billion shares in Stephen or Rufus Limited, and guess what? They're worth $10 each. So they're worth, I've got $10 million of equity, but I'm the one paying $10 to buy my own shares which famously, I don't know if you know, there's a very famous fraud case involving Guinness, the beer that everyone knows about, in which some of the directors went to prison about, I think, 30 now in the late 80s or early 90s, in which they were doing exactly this. This is totally illegal in normal equity circles. You're not allowed to buy your own stock, pump your own stock, uh, manipulate the price of things associated with you. And this is going on. And I want to mention this because it looks like, and again, we don't know the details, but it looks extreme. One of the things that blew up Alameda and FTX was someone revealing two, about two weeks ago that the main holder of FTX's token that looked like this, called FTT, their magic token, their magic money printing machine, was a related party, i.e., Alameda. It turned out that it seemed like almost half of Alameda's uh, declared assets, at least on this interior bank. Uh, sheet, and I think I'm getting the number right, Stephen will correct me, was their holding of this other token, which was this kind of made up token of FTX. And this was very clever. So FTX needs to have money and show money into other people. It issues this kind of token. It has a related party buy up that token, pumping up the price. They both hold the token at these inflated values on their on their balance sheets. But actually, when it comes to it, it, it's, it goes to zero. And that happened in Terra Luna, that happened now with FTT and FTX. And that's a suspicion I want to emphasize to people listening on this podcast. That is that is something that almost all the other exchanges have gone and done. Something extremely similar to this. And it's also, you've got to basically mark that asset to zero on their balance sheet or any other situation. And it often accounts for a disproportionate amount of their actual equity, i.e. the cushion that banks or other people are supposed to hold beyond their customer deposits that is, you know, the skin they have in the game, the, sh the skin that their shareholders have in the game that has gives them an incentive to act honest. Now, is there anything, Stephen, you'd like to add to that long explanation about the two major dynamics, which is the straightforward, like, kind of fraud or, like, gamble model, um, which is I take my customer funds and gamble with them if it works. Heads, heads I win, tails you lose kind of story. Or the other model of like issuing to get to get that going, you often need equity. And to get the equity, you issue these kind of magic coins that you can then kind of pump and dump or pump mostly. Yeah, I mean, to go back to your analysis about like why the sort of bank attached to a hedge fund model is like not allowed in normal markets is because, you know, um, when you custody other people's money, uh, you have an obligation to them as, as a fiduciary, right? Um, and we saw this, we, we haven't had a bank run in Western markets in a hundred years uh, because we have a, a framework in place that prevents a lot of these malign behaviors that arise when there's no safeguards around handling, handling other people's money. Um, and deposit insurance is one that you mentioned, but also like banks are public companies. They have a balance sheet that they have to report to the public. And for very large banks, most often the bank examiners are literally co-located inside of the office of the bank itself. And on a daily basis, they have to report their assets and liabilities to the central bank, right? And the central bank has a very good view about what exactly is the balance sheet of every single bank on every single day, right? So with these crypto exchanges, um, imagine there's no deposit insurance, there's no bank examiners, and they have no reporting obligations to anybody. Um, so it's they not even have surprising. A board and not even a board of directors. Not even a board of directors either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like I was actually, um, I was part of a bank or credit union that actually went insolvent during the great financial crisis, actually. And what happened to me is I found out about this in the mail one day when suddenly they sent me a letter and they're like, oh, we don't exist anymore, but congratulations, you're now a you know a customer of Citibank. Uh, here's your new debit card. And like all my funds were just transferred over, right? Um, so like, you know, we have a model that basically works to protect most customers. And for me, like when my bank just basically, you know, collapsed, it didn't matter at all because I just became, okay, all my funds were just automatically custodied over to the new bank, right? Um, because there's a, you know, a sensible framework that's, you know, built on a hundred years of, you know, learned experience of people losing their money. Um, and, you know, to go back to your infinite money machine analysis, right? Imagine if um, JP Morgan basically, you know, issued JP Morgan stock, 
Um, and there's a bit of a difference between the tokens and the equity uh, because an equity represents claims on the future cash flows of a company versus a crypto token is represents a claim on nothing. It's just a greater fool asset, right? But imagine you were to go to JP Morgan's balance sheet and the vast majority of their holdings were in JP Morgan stock, right? You basically have this sort of, I, I don't know, it's like a, you know, imagine plugging you know core into itself. I mean, that's what this business is. It's propped up on nothing, right? Where is, where is this actually coming from? It looks like, you know, we just created it. So they were double counting um, the stock as both an equity um, and basically, you know, it represented you know, whatever the speculative value was, what it was on their balance sheet. Um, and it, this is unsustainable. Like, it's yes. completely absurd. So that's that that nice really just already emphasized to people the infinite mounting machine looks like jp morgan didn't even issue stock they issued some just kind of i don't know, we call it a token but it's like a share but with no claims on jp morgan or its future revenues it's just like like a bond which with with zero repayment an infinite bond where you're going to give jp morgan money you've got this kind of bond but other people the only value is that other people might value the bond or they claim that they will buy the bond back but don't promise to do so at some level and then they they themselves or related parties buy up this asset. And then they say, well, look, some other people have bought it, but we still have like a million of these on our balance sheet. We're going to mark them to market at whatever they're being traded at. And we can infinite, we, you know, we and, and we're, we're going to like- and Issue more of them too. You can sprint them on and demand. <laughs> and, then, and then just keep running this and then use our money that we've somehow got to buy other things. Um, so I think the thing to warn people about is that, that, that in, in expansion, when things are going well, that can lead to this kind of incredible growth because you kind of, as, as at least if people are still buying, you get this kind of exponential blob. But on the come down, it's exactly the opposite. The implosion is incredibly fast and incredibly rapid because just as it went up in that way, and I can kind of print more tokens and then pump their value. And now, you know, I've got, you know, the probably went from $10 to $20. Now I've got like twice as much capital as I had before. And it's why we end up with these incredible numbers like Sam Bankman Freed at under 30 years, you know, the richest, there's worth $30 billion or $20 billion. Or, and you kind of like, how did he go from $24 billion to zero in a, in a week? Like, how, how is that possible? Well, it's because of what we're describing. When you've built something on this kind of air and the air goes, it's going to be very, very fast. And I want to say, come to kind of like, what do we want to look at next? I want to say, you know, a little bit on this call. And like, what can we learn from this? And what is it? What we're describing is classic stuff. Um, what is it about crypto that causes otherwise rational people to abandon common sense and rational thought? Like, why? How is it possible that people, you know, this was being said a bit, but there was a lot of like, no, no, line goes up, you know, just things. And even among like seasoned venture capitalist investors, it seemed, um, didn't do this. Uh, and, you know, what, how is how is that so? And I think we want to come back. So one is, what do you, Stephen, do you have any thoughts about what's coming next? Like, first of all, we'll be called to come to that second question. What's next to fall or is the next to be impacted? Yeah, so like all of this happened effectively last week. It was the craziest week I've ever seen. Um, and yeah, he basically took, you know, a $34 billion valuation and lit it on fire to zero in the span of about 48 hours. Um, this is, I can't overstate this. This is completely mental. Um, but a lot of the problems arise out of one simple thing, um, the opacity of this structure. We had no idea what was going on or like even what the corporate structure of this entity even looked like until they filed for chapter 11 bankruptcy. Um, this was a black box sitting in the Bahamas with allegedly billions of dollars sloshing around in it with absolutely no reporting requirements. Um, and, you know, say what you will about the banks, but they have to have, you know, very, very clear financials that are available for the public to see. And you couldn't get away with this infinite money machine trick if you just did this in lit markets um, where the information was actually available because this would show up as an accounting discrepancy. Um, you can't just print... Um, all of this fictitious capital out of thin air um, when you actually have to report to your board of directors, your shareholders, to a bank examiner, um, to a central bank. Um, and so this entire FTX catastrophe arises out of one simple thing. Um, it was a black box um, and that should not exist. I mean, we should not have these completely opaque financial institutions because it's going to end exactly the same way. People are going to use it as um, a vehicle for fraud. Um, and 
The problem with crypto is that, and with every financial mania throughout history, is that people just lose their minds. Um, they think that, you know, this thing is clearly unsustainable, but I can time it. Um, and if I get my money out, then I can walk away with some money. Um, and this has been true since the 1700s, obviously. Um, people, human nature doesn't change all that much. Um, everybody becomes a part of the bubble because they think that they're unique in the fact that they're going to get their money out. Um, and, you know, as we've seen in the past, the vast majority of people will lose everything. Um, and that's exactly what happened. So, I mean, I would really point everybody to the letter that we wrote to Congress um, about uh, three months ago, the concern.tech letter, uh, in which we outlined basically a lot of these requirements. Like, all we have to do to fix a lot of these problems and protect consumers is basically bring exactly the same disclosures and investor protections that exist in lit markets to the crypto market, um, and then make a lot of these catastrophes completely um, you couldn't actually run them in the first place because like you couldn't be able to get away with this stuff uh, because you'd have to basically be cooking the books and at some point somebody would catch you. But if you're able to run all these things in some sort of offshore tax haven in ways that you have no obligations to any kind of governance structure or to any kind of regulators, then yeah, we're just going to keep seeing this over and over again. So clearly we need to bring the stuff within the regulatory perimeter. Just to say, we've seen, just to kind of walk back again, Let's look at some of the other players like Crypto.com, BlockFi, Binance, Coinbase, some of the other players. Do they have these magical money tokens as well? Like, do they, the magical money machine um, that we see, are, are any of those got similar issues that we just described? Like, are any of them, a, is there any other issues of opacity? Like, is, is do any of the others have like really amazing governance where it's very transparent, what's on their balance sheet, what their liabilities are, where it's very easy, where they have like bank, the equivalent of bank inspectors, or are they quite even as opaque or maybe more opaque than FTX. Just what's the sense at the moment on those? Do they, yeah. Yeah, so the offshore exchanges like Binance, which is the largest by volume in the entire world is even more opaque than FTX. We have no idea where this company is even headquartered. We know some of their correspondent banking relationships are in the Cayman Islands, but that's about it. Um, they've been banned in the United States. They're banned here in Britain. Um, you know, they basically operate as this sort of offshore casino boat that we have absolutely no visibility into. And, you know, um, Cheng Pen Zhao, the CEO of uh, Binance, makes like you know, Sam Bankman fried look like the Easter Bunny. Like he is a ruthless capitalist who is extremely Machiavellian and will probably do whatever it takes to make his company successful. Um, and he has no pretense to ever be regulated. Um, he thinks it's entire, antithetical to his entire business model and that crypto should always exist outside the regulatory perimeter. And then you have a bunch of other these like onshore exchanges in the United States. So they can't get away with it, the same kind of shady things that the, the Bahamani and the Caribbean companies can. So um, we have some insight into the um, finances of Coinbase because they're a public company. Um, the problem is that Coinbase's only regulatory framework is as a money transmitter business. Um, so they are not regulated as an exchange. An exchange. Um, they have no requirements to have a fair matching engine. Um, they're not overseen by the SEC. Um, they are regulated on the same regulatory framework as like say Western Union or like TurboTax, uh, which is to say a very, very soft touch. Um, and when you become a so-called depositor of Coinbase, you're an unsecured creditor. Uh, you have no obligations. If Coinbase goes to zero, which if you look at their stock is seems quite likely given the trend line, um, you know, you have basically no legal claims on anything other than whatever the company liquidates in bankruptcy. Um, and unlike say like a Fidelity or Charles Schwab, um, you know, there's no SDIC insurance on your particular holdings because crypto is not regulated as, um, well, not currently yet regulated as a security. Um, and so, you know, Coinbase could fall victim to the same kind of problems that Celsius fell problem to um, because, you know, there's basically no controls on this stuff. Um, and that's a problem. So even the safer, so-called safe ones onshore are still very loosely regulated and none of the regulation would actually protect most consumers from another catastrophic meltdown. And with what's happening last week, we have no idea how much contagion there is in the market. Like we're gonna, I'm gonna look at the Financial Times in a few minutes and see what happened. Cause like this is all evolving in real time and the plates are still very much spinning. And so just to also, again, 
that just brings up something to the audience again to understand, and which came up in the great financial crisis and many crises before, which is the often the the issue in any economy, but particularly of financial entities, uh, is that um, the assets we talked about, like the classic bank, is I, I or, or or an exchange, although exchange is just supposed to make money off its you know, crypto. It's weird. Exchanges traditionally only like help execute trades and take a commission in theory on that. They don't. They don't like. And they custody you what they're holding for you. They don't. They don't get to use your assets for other things. But in crypto exchanges, that's not necessarily true, as we found out yeah. uh, with FTX. But let's go. So they operate a bit more like a bank, where they have your assets and they can do kind of things with them. Um, just to explain, which is that often in that process, and it's certainly the case with many of these uh, crypto entities, uh, but it might even be the case with a bank that I might have my investments held you know i might not just have bought mortgage you know lent people money i might have used my money to go and buy the stock of other companies or invest in the stock market and the crypto exchanges do that so one of the things they'll do or crypto entities is i've got money and i'm then going to go and invest elsewhere and obviously that's true particularly for, obviously at the extreme for hedge funds that's exactly what their crypto hedge funds are doing but um you know or, or trading in some other way um but even ftx and others which you know, supposed to be a bit more like banks are kind of doing that. And to explain that, what then happens, let's say I'm a bank X or crypto exchange slash bank slash hedge fund slash some weird entity that's very unregulated. I, and Stevens, another one, I've got an, I'm holding a bunch of Stevens tokens or other stuff. And if, if then Steven goes bankrupt or go, something goes wrong, that obviously not only do his tokens that I've held, like, you know, kind of fall to zero, um, but also, you know, his collapse impacts the value of assets generally in the market. And so this kind of what we talk about when we talk about contagion, I know this might be very familiar, but essentially, uh, you know, Stephen's collapse impacts my assets on my balance sheet, Rufus's kind of Rufus's crypto exchange. Uh, and therefore, I'm I become potentially become insolvent. And then that keeps going. You know, I become insolvent, then I and Stephen insolvent. So, you know, party three and particularly because we've talked about this has made worse. The, the, the cross-party holdings are massive. Uh, people are holding each other's tokens with a lot of like almost I'll buy yours if you'll buy mine kind of stuff going on here. Um, for example, this was triggered by that Binance had got paid. Binance had invested in FTX uh, to start FTX. Binance were bought out by FTX, but partly by being paid in FTX's own made up token, which then Binance were then dumping last week, which was partly what triggered the run. So there's a lot of these cross party exchanges. There's a lot of inflated values. So, again, the, just as it helped in blowing up the bubble, the rapidity here in many banks is much more limits on this. There's much more limits on market to market. There's a lot of restrictions on cross holdings, on the diversity of holdings, on the safety of homings, the value at risk. None of that exists. So the, 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 the risk of contagion between it, what sounds like you'd be like, why would a stock, why would the New York Stock Exchange going bankrupt have any impact on like the London Stock Exchange? And what you've got to understand here is what these are called exchanges are often just like hedge fund, exchange, bank, you know, merged into one with zero regulation of any of those parts. And so the, of the, the risk of contagion is massively higher um, as these things have happened. And uh, that's already been happening this year with Terra Luna, then what happened at Celsius and so on, um, along with just straightforward fraud. But we do want to emphasize the systemic aspects of this. It isn't, the fraud is sort of probably, and I would make a guess here, and I, if it is the case that what happened is Sam Bankman-Fried moved money to Alameda or, and, or whoever did, my suspicion is it was because of the pressure they were experiencing of the kind I've described. The fraud wasn't the original intention. It would became a consequence of the breakdown from early systemic problems. We don't know. And I'm just speculating here, but I'm just pointing that out. And I want to come back to this rational people point then at the end, which is having said all this, what was going on? And I say this particularly strongly because um, I've also been amazed at some of the reason we've done this series. If also the utopian aspirations, the, 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 the people interested in crypto who aren't, who were even from a very, I would say, well-intentioned, even Bankman Fried himself, who was very into effective altruism, who it sounds like, at least from what his statements a lot, was doing this just to make the world a better place. He was just trying to make as much money as possible so he could then give it away to charity. What is it that attracts people? And what is it that allows what seems like, you know, rational common sense to be, to be lost? And I think 
it's worth reiterating this because sadly it seems that humans need to keep learning the problems of these speculative bubbles these great disasters again but i also think there's something more interesting in there so i want to start with the more interesting part before it's the everyday part which is that we forget we get excited about money which is we are in um an era of i think great um great challenge challenges there's a lot of fear there's a lot of anxiety there's the climate crisis but there's also um you know people you know even without that people are like the, my future's gonna be less good my children's future's gonna be less good than mine there's a lot of fear of the future there's a lot of financial insecurity the world is changing very quickly people's jobs are often insecure all kinds of things and i think it creates a space and i think this was discussed in line goes up the great documentary that was done many others but there's something sociologically going on that that makes get rich switch uh, get rich quick schemes there's a distrust in the state and its regulation there's a lot of cynicism and distrust but also fear and this is a potent mixture for people like oh well we can all get rich this way or you know look at this you know often much of the crypto world presents itself as kind of like robin hood-esque or like defying the man or like we're going to do things differently. We're going to be radical and, you know, alternative and a bit anarchist and edgy. Um, and it's and it's almost weird from the outside to watch that combined with often what seems like very conservative or neoliberal ideology, maybe not conservative, but like straight up neoliberal ideology about financialization. So I think there's a sociological aspect that's very important at the present time. I think there's never the underestimate the impact of a lot of money to change people's minds, money that seems to be appearing. You know, there's nothing that makes us uh, less reliable than the thought of our neighbor getting rich. I think there's a famous quote like that. Then the, the, there's a very, very destabilizing when we see others um, making lots of money and us not. And I, I, I've heard personal stories of that from people and one re read them online in the newspaper. Um, and then there's the final part. We just constantly seem to have to relearn lessons for financial history although each time we get a bit better and i think one here about the multinational world is that most bank runs a century ago in the last great depression were still national even though there were international aspects in trade you didn't have u.s citizens um, buying stuff from a bahamian company it just didn't happen you you didn't have this globalized world where Place like Binance, even though they're sim, in theory banned from the US or from other countries, can still operate in this netherworld where you can still buy things from them. And I think it is an open question of what regulation is required, um, or, or you know, and, and, you know, and there is that argument of of the more libertarian, which is just the greater fools, this, the people who suffer. But it seems a very hard line to take, particularly when they're taking out ads at the Super Bowl. Um, when these things are being promoted to ordinary common people, it's not simply people who somehow found it themselves and invested themselves. But are there any comments from you, Stephen, about what you think is at the kind of root of this of this kind of recent madness of the crowd uh, that we've seen? Yeah, the sociological aspect of this is very difficult to cover from an intellectual perspective because if we go back to like you know two thousand eight. Um, when crypto was actually created, it was created as a reaction to the speculative excesses of Wall Street. When we fast forward 14 years later, it's become the very apotheosis of the thing it arose out of, right? In fact, it's actually become a worse version of it. Crypto basically you know, started as a reaction to the Bear Stearns and Lehman collapse, and then in 14 years, recreated exactly the same kind of conditions that gave rise to the global financial crisis, but in a very small, more isolated way. Um, and um, the post hoc rationalization that goes into that sort of like slow boiling frog between, you know, this is this, you know, new utopian financial system, all the way up to us having, um, you know, centralized institutions, which are embezzling money and, you know, taking extreme risk on the back of you know, depositors. Um, it's been very strange to watch because trying to kind of rationalize this as being this utopian project is becoming increasingly more untenable when you look at the base reality of what's actually being done in crypto. And that's really the the, the thrust of uh, the thrust of my thesis on this stuff is that like all we're really doing is basically rediscovering um, the problems of the past and. Most of the problems with the last FTX would be solved by a very simple solution. In normal exchanges, uh, there's a separation between the exchange, market makers, um, broker dealers, uh, and the clearinghouse. Those are four different entities, 
right? They all have different concerns. They make money in different ways and they all have obligations and they report to different regulators. Um, and that system is remarkably, I'll say anti-fragile, like it has stood up the test of time. And when you compact all of those entities into one vertically integrated stack, that design has baked into it a large set of conflicts of interest, which are inescapable. Um, and until we can be able to like separate those entities out, we're going to keep seeing this over and over and over again. Um, and, you know, the sociological aspect of this is that um, we just have to look back and like realize that there's some wisdom in learning from the past. Um, and despite all of us having fears and anxiety about the future, um, oftentimes the problems the answers to our current problems often lie in things that we've, you know, the failures of the past. And with crypto, you know, we just have to put these things in perspective and understand them a bit better. And despite all of the problems with the current financial system, um, what the crypto world has created is actually far worse. Um, <laughs> so that's my takeaway. Takeaway. I think one thing for maybe our next episode, if we if we do one on this, I would like is there'll be people I've seen like maybe Vitalik uh, Buterin already, already saying this like, oh, the solution was not enough decentralization. Look, you know, FTX was centralized. Um, you know, we should have these decentralized market makers. Um, and and it goes back then also to the utopian aspirations that I think give a lot of engine, either get provide actual engine or provide cover. You know, there, there's I mean, imagine like I don't know Sequoia or like we're investing in FTX. Because it's an exchange and an exchange in the expanding market, like, you know, crypto is going to be massive. It's going to take over the world. Everything's going to be, you know, tokens and trading and so on. And I think that's something we need to maybe revisit is that bigger, that there'll be a bunch of people now who say, oh, yes, that was bad. But that's because we didn't do enough decentralization. I think we need, that will be something else to come. And then, there might be truth in that or not, but we, I think we'll leave it for today. But that will be something I think that would be interesting to explore. I mean, if you have any thoughts right now on that as a trailer for episode two in this series, of you know exploring exploring where the utopian dreams are now you know uh you know night a year into the the biggest crypto winter so far what would you what you know what will you know like some people will be saying right now this is a winter again don't worry in two years we'll be building we'll be, we'll be building back well at some point i think there's others and i think Stephen, you'd probably be among them you'd say no no there's some point when this this experiment will kind of it is kind of doomed to fail and it will fail and there's a point where it it will actually kind of like self-terminate. It's not going to, it can't keep going. And that, you know, it, 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 so I just want to like, yeah, on that front, what you'd say, you know, beyond the kind of like more classic, like we didn't have the proper financial regulation for an exchange, the deeper kind of claims and aspects of crypto is like, this is the future of the economy. This is the future of society. How do you think this, this outcome with FTX impacts that? That's the common retort I hear to this argument is that like, well, okay, Bernie Madoff exists. Uh, but that doesn't mean that all of, you know, the global financial system is bad, right? Basically, Sam Bankman-Fried is basically like Elizabeth Holmes or like, you know, Adam Newman at best or, or Bernie, you know, like Bernie Madoff, that I'm Bernie Madoff, right? Um, so, but I mean, then we have to ask the question like, okay, if the decentralized world is the solution, what does it exist to do? That's a question we can ask and answer analytically, but like I would go back to the conversations we've had in the past, like crypto is, okay, it's not acting as money. Um, it's not building a new financial system. It's not building a new internet. Um, it's not an uncorrelated asset with the market. And it's not a hedge against inflation. So what is it? Um, it's a vehicle for pure naked speculation. I don't deny that. Um, it's a thing that will just go up and down randomly um, that people can trade. Um, but what does that exist to do? Markets exist to, you know, balance supply and demand of goods and services. With crypto, you've created this pure platonic ideal of a market completely detached from any goods and services or any aspect of human life other than naked speculation. Um, and so, yes, <laughs> the DeFi world can continue to go on this sort of uh, this run of naked speculation and people can make money and most people will lose money. But what does this do? Um, and at that point, then we have to do a kind of cost benefit analysis of like, what is this doing in the world? Um, is it mostly positive or is it mostly negative? Um, and we've done this analysis in the past, so we can do it again. Uh, but like the answer that more decentralization is the answer, well, what is it the answer to do, <laughs> right? And that's the fundamental question that I always keep asking with crypto is like 14 years on, besides naked speculation and crime, what does this entire ecosystem exist to do? And I haven't heard a sufficiently compelling answer to that question yet.
Thank you. And I think on that note, it's a great ending point. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. The, the show notes, uh, this will be up, but also with detailed show notes and links on uh, web3.lifeitself.org as the latest episode, and also on Stephen's emerging uh, technology uh, site. So thank you, everyone, for listening in. And if you want to you know, tune in for more, just subscribe on our YouTube channel, uh, Life Itself, uh, or subscribe on the website. Thank you so much. And we look forward to uh, your feedback and you're interested in the future episodes. Thank you. Cheers.